out, and another one put hers in, and took it, and bring it out, and maybe a third one. And Jesus said that this, this flower of the field, which served to just be a fuel for an oven, see, that this is a more beautifully built flower, more perfectly built, than this gorgeous clothing which Solomon had made for him. And then he says to us, if God spends that much time on field flowers, wild flowers, we would say, wouldn't he take care of you? In other words, quit worrying. In Luke chapter 12 and verse 29, where we've been discussing Jesus' attitude toward wealth. And do not seek what you are to eat and what you are to drink, nor be of anxious mind. For all the nations of the world seek these things, and your Father knows what you need. Instead, seek his kingdom, and these things shall be yours as well. Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. We continue here with this statement, do not seek what you're going to eat and drink, nor worry. And then he said, this is what the nations of the world seek after. Friends, if you have an old magazine around the house, you can conduct a little experiment for yourself, which will prove this to you very, very quickly. Go through the old magazine, and before you discard it, tear out every advertisement in it that has to do with food. Go through again and tear out every advertisement that has to do with cold drinks, soft drinks, beer, liquor, whatnot, in the way of beverages. Go back again and tear everything out that has to do with jewelry, clothing, hats, shoes. When you've gotten through with what they eat, drink, and wear, you probably will have torn out over half the magazine. This is exactly what the Gentiles of our generation, as well as the Gentiles of Jesus' generation, think about. What they eat, what they drink, and what they wear. If we'd add to that something that was not available in Jesus' day, automobiles, we would just about finish the magazine. Jesus said, these are the things that the world seeks after. And then he adds this all-important statement, which goes back to the matter of the sparrows, goes back to the matter of the hairs on your head, goes back to the ravens, goes back to flowers in the field, when he says, your father knows that you have need of all these things. And then, instead of seeking after what you're going to eat, or what you're going to drink, or what you're going to wear, seek seek first the kingdom of God. He's earlier said that we're to ask and to seek and to knock. And now he continues this thought with the idea of seeking and seek the kingdom of God first and the things, the material aspects of life shall be added unto you. And then a further encouragement, little flock, God wants to give you not houses, lands, food, clothing, shelter, although they will come. He wants to give you something lots better than that. He wants to give you the kingdom of God. And we have people who'd rather have a house than the kingdom of God, rather have a car than the kingdom of God, rather have a certain political position than the kingdom of God. God wants to give you the kingdom to share what he has, his kingdom the kingdom of God, and it's a measure of our stupidity and our carnality and our unspirituality that we would rather have things than the kingdom. What do you want? What do you want? Verse 33 and 34, we're put to a test here. Sell your possessions and give alms. Provide yourselves with purses that do not grow old, with a treasure in heaven that does not fail where no thief approaches and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. <clears throat> All right, he said here actually that 
you can actually transfer your bank account from heaven to earth by moving your possessions into alms, that is, the needy elsewhere. Some years ago, I was asked to give a talk by first one Lions Club and before I was through by three of them on the subject of peace. I'd been an army chaplain and the, in World War II, and so they had chose me to speak on this subject. And the line of thought I gave was more like this. Do you really want peace? And of course, they would have answered before I asked, surely. After I asked it, they weren't so sure. And then I asked them what they meant by peace. I said, if you're talking now about um, bullets flying in the air, submachine gun bullets flying around, bombs going off, and hand grenades exploding here and there, I suppose none of us really want this. But if you mean by peace that we're going to freeze the present distribution of wealth in the world, then I'm not sure we want it. And I mentioned that I'd been in Brazil at a time when one year, some nearly 10 years ago, when the increase in the income of the average American uh, was $200 a year. At that same year, the average income of a Brazilian was $200 a year. His total equaled our increase per capita. And this vast disparity between uh, the haves and the have-nots is too wide a gap to institutionalize and to settle down forever. If we can find some way of allowing the gap to narrow without bullets flying, then I'm in favor of peace. But if what we mean is that we're going to let them keep on living on $200 a year while we have our two or three motor cars per family and go surfboarding every weekend, then I think this will not come. We cannot have this much disparity and still have any kind of righteous equity before God. Provide yourselves by equity with purses that will not grow old in the world to come, where the treasure does not fail. Thieves can't approach it, no moth destroys it. And then this all powerful truth, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. I've told the story before of a chemistry prof who was playing volleyball with a team composed mostly of professors and a few uh, students, of which I was one, to fill out the staff. And a fire alarm came, and the gym was between his private laboratory on one side and his home, where his wife and child were on the other. When the fire alarm went off, he raced to the side of the gym on which was located his laboratory. He thought about the laboratory before he thought about his wife and child. Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And times of pressure reveal the truth to us. We're going to turn now to a related subject about being watching for the coming of the Lord's kingdom. This will be in Luke 12, verses 35 through verse 38. Let your, let your loins be girded and your lamps burning, and be like men who are waiting for their master to come home from the marriage feast, so that they may open to him at once when he comes and knocks. Blessed are those servants whom the master finds awake when he comes. Truly, I say to you, he will gird himself and have them sit at the table and come and serve him. If he comes in, the second watch, or in the third, and finds them so, blessed are those servants. This is another story which is taken out of those times, and yet adapted because part of it is characteristic and part of it's not. He said that we are to have our loins girded. Now, there are several things here which um, are a little strange to our way of saying. We do not speak about a man's waist or his thighs as being his loins. Uh, 